a reminder that there are lots of different sessions throughout the day. Uh, they are being recorded and you'll have a link to that so you can watch this session again or any of the other sessions that you might have uh, missed um, throughout the day, as well as a note that the resources will be also posted so you'll see the, the PowerPoint that's shared as well uh, for that. So if we just go to the next slide, please, Rachel, if you could, that would be great. This is just more of a, an introduction for folks um, that if we uh, need to, in terms of this is your first time on a session, uh, but we have, uh, there's a chat window, as we mentioned, with the little comic icon in the bottom right corner that you can join in and interact and engage and ask questions, make comments. A note that as the, at the end of the session, there'll be a survey that'll be provided, an opportunity for you to provide uh, feedback at the end of each session. That helps us to continue to learn and grow. And as well as we noted, the resources and recordings will be uh, shared with you as well. So thank you for joining us. And the next slide will just give us a quick introduction. And uh, that's just to tell you that making sure that you're in the right session. This is uh, a AP pre-calculus session. And this one, uh, I just had the chance to be uh, part of the panel session just previously uh, that get an overview. This one's going to be specifically focusing on polynomial and rational functions. And I'm really excited that uh, Greg, excuse me, Greg and Rachel are here to present with us. And I know that we did some uh, discussion last week. They've got some great stuff to share with you. So I'll turn it over to them. Thank you, uh, Rachel, and thank you, Greg. Good, good morning. morning. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, um, to everyone. And same here. It's good to be with everybody. Um, Greg and I have been working on writing a pre-calculus book for the last couple of years. And so we're really passionate about AP pre-calculus. And I'm right now not teaching it. I'm teaching Algebra 1, Geometry. And the reason that I think that's important to share is all of us on this call, whether we're teaching AP pre-calculus or not, it's important that we realize that it's about preparing every student to do whatever they want to do in their future. So whether you're an Algebra 1 teacher, Geometry, I think you're going to get something important out of this today um, because it's about seeing where our students are going. Greg, do you want to share a little bit about the agenda? Um, sure. We're, we're going to be um, giving you an overview and telling you about resources, but we're really going to try to dig in with a sample question that we got from the uh, course and exam description uh, from the College Board, which I guess will reveal the the depth um, of understanding that's that uh, is expected from this course, um, and also reveal just how much you can do with functions without having the tools of derivative and integral. There's a lot you can do before you get to calculus to gain a deep understanding of functions. Exactly. We're gonna be using the chat a lot today too. So I just put a link in there um, so that we can get a little information about you hopefully. It's a link to a Google form. Tell me if it's not working. Um, but we wanna learn a little bit about everyone in our group what you're teaching, what your experience is with AP. Um, so if you don't mind clicking on that and then we'll bring the results in in a little bit. What we're hoping to do today is um, help people recognize the change in emphasis or structure from a traditional pre-calculus course and highlight some of these features of the AP pre-calculus course that you may or may not know about. Talk a little bit about assessment. One of the items, like Greg said, is going to be an assessment item that was shared and, and share a little bit about some resources that we we use ourselves but also we found helpful for others. So one of the first things I want to do is while you're filling out that form, I also want to give some quiet time for you to look over this slide. I pulled this straight from the AP Precalculus CED. This is what unit one is. It's labeled polynomial and rational functions. And I just want to quiet myself for a little slide, bit. Maybe? Oh, is it not showing up for I'm overview of polynomial? I'm seeing expected outcomes still oh. of the 
Well, I'm so glad that y'all are sharing that with me. Is it working okay now? It, I've got, I see it now. Yep. Overview. Overview. Okay. Yep. Awesome. I'm glad you let me know. So for this one, I just want you to look at this. Um, and as I'm quiet, I want you to let us know what are some of the things that you notice and wonder, but we're going to do this um, in a, in a kind of, I call it a waterfall chat. So we want you to type some of your ideas into the chat about what you notice. Oh, thank you, Laura. I see in my screen, I see AP Central too. So I'm not sure if there was a lag or not, Yeah, but there, there we go. There must be a lag because I'm still seeing expected outcomes. I don't know what's wrong. Okay. Well, can you guys tell me in the chat, are you seeing overview of polynomials and rational functions now? AP Central, I'm telling uh, yes, you. Yes, they are. Oh, there I'm, we go. <laughs> I'm seeing overview, yep. Well, I'm telling you, this chat is really helping out because you guys are going to be just like my students today. You're going to keep me on the right page. Um, I've got everything prepped, but you guys will, your communication is going to help out a lot. Thank you for that. So um, the polynomials and rational functions, I pulled this straight from the CED, and I just want to do a notice and wonder. What do you notice? What do you wonder? And how does this compare with what you've taught previously in pre-calculus? So I'm going to quiet myself for just a moment. Lori, if you could let me know if you still see a white screen, or is it now polynomials and rational functions? Is anyone else just seeing a white screen? I'm still seeing expected outcomes, as if this slide was never advanced. Okay, well, it looks like the majority in the, the chat are seeing overview. So, um, like I said, I'm going to give myself a moment. Thank you so much for the feedback in the chat, folks. Um, and then what I want you to do is write down something you notice, something you wonder, but please don't hit enter yet. And that'll give us just a moment for um, everyone to collect their thoughts before we all share out. And then I'll share with Greg a little bit about what I'm seeing in the chat. And um, we'll kind of take it from there, but I want to give you some time to look at this yourself first. Okay. It just switched to overview about 15 seconds ago. From okay. on the bottom. So I think it's lagging for some people it may have to do with bandwidth or I don't know what. So we'll maybe just... you're in a different time zone, Greg. I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no estoy en los uh, Filipinos. I'm not in the Philippines, um, but um, it's taking longer in tropical Ohio. So folks, let's go ahead and hit enter at this point in time. Share some of those notices and wonders. We want to see where you guys are coming from, um, what you're focused on when you're looking at this. And this is going to be a great formative assessment for us to see what you're what you're thinking. And I'm going to just keep quiet for a moment as you also scroll through the chat and read what other people are saying. Mm -hmm. So, Greg, as I'm looking through the chat, one of the things I'm noticing the most is this idea of uh, rate of change, change in tandem. This seems to be a really new idea for a lot of folks who have had experience teaching pre-calculus, but now are teaching AP pre-calculus. Right. Another hey. thing that, mm -hmm. sorry. Go ahead. Another thing that Candace is saying is it, it's linking a lot of ideas together. This idea of lots and lots of functions, but exploring them in multiple ways and integrating those. And so I, I'm kind of, I'm going to stop talking for a moment and give you a chance to respond to those. And I'm going to keep reading through the chat for myself. Okay. So in the AP uh, course, the new AP pre-calculus course, um, it's divided into four units, but within each unit, even though it says polynomial and rational functions or logarithmic and exponential functions, there are some overarching concepts such as change in tandem, rate of change, um, and here you've got uh, transformation of functions is uh, topic number 12. 
Well, the transformation of functions is going to first be examined in the context of polynomial and rational functions, but it will be revisited uh, when you get to exponential and logarithmic functions, to trigonometric functions, and even polar functions. How do you transform the graphs of polar functions? Um, there you have rotations in addition to um, uh, stretches or elongations and uh, shifts or translations. So, so there's some overarching concepts that apply to any function. End behavior is first looked at in the context of rational functions, but you can talk about the end behavior of other functions as well. And when it's tested, there will be a big chunk of the test that deals with these overarching concepts, continuity, end behavior, rate of change, change in tandem, the, uh, domain, range, those apply to all functions. And so um, you want to revisit those through each unit. So there are these threads that go throughout the course. The other thing on this slide, of course, is that it says uh, there's mathematical practices down in the right hand corner. And uh, Rachel and I feel that those are super important threads that go throughout the course, that the, the uh, procedural and symbolic fluency includes fluency with the use of technology. The multiple representations is linking graphical, numerical, algebraic, and verbal together. And then the communication and reasoning piece, I think, is something that is not typically emphasized in pre-calculus. So in addition to the concepts that maybe are deeper um, and, um, uh, you know, like uh, in the chat, it was mentioned that you're not just doing rates of change of linear functions, but you're doing rates of change and second order rates of change of nonlinear functions, which is uh, pretty heady stuff, pretty um, intellectually sophisticated for the before calculus level. Yeah, and I think that a lot of people um, are, are definitely picking up on those points too. One thing that stood out to me was also, oh, where was it? I got There were so many good things on here. We do want to talk a little bit about holes today that was mentioned in here. And the other idea that there is a much stronger emphasis on verbal descriptions instead of just algebraic manipulation. That was something that Lori shared about. And that was something I noticed as well as I was looking through this. The fact that so many of these standards, when we look at the mathematical practices, so many of them have a three on them. And that code right there means that communication and reasoning is something that's expected in pretty much all of these different topics under polynomial and rational functions. So I definitely agree. Students aren't just going to be expected to solve an algebraic equation. They're going to be asked to write about it, to talk about it, and use that vocab to be able to, to communicate about it. Okay. And I, I will try to talk about change in tandem, because that may be something, uh, I, what the heck is that? That it's a totally new concept. So in brief, this is that in a function, you have an input and an output. You have an X and a Y. And as X changes in value, Y changes in value. And this idea that the two variables are related to each other. So the stock market changes over time. So time is changing, right? Today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and so is the value of the stock prices. And they change together in tandem as, uh, as, a, as a pair uh, as, as they move forward. So um, do you have the results of who who's on the call? I mean, how many are AP, how many are pre-calculus, that sort of thing? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and I put a TI Inspire document together. So I just went ahead and copied and pasted this. Although I look, it looks like I missed a column here. So give me one moment. I just copied and pasted it from my Google Doc, but I think I must have missed one of these rows. 
So thanks for your patience. There we go. I missed the technology question. How could I be on a technology call and miss a technology question? That's okay because the Inspire has an undo button, which I use heavily, and I'm just able to do that. Um, so let's see if we can paste that. That's beautiful. And then some of the things that we have here are AP pre-calculus teachers. We have this many who are not AP pre-calculus teachers. And we have several who are pre-calculus teachers. So it looks like we have just a bit of an edge there. Yeah, almost 50-50. Almost 50-50. And then technology, uh, TI-84 is definitely out in front. So we'll tailor this session to be um, related to TI-84 technology. But if you have any questions about TI Inspire, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I personally use TI Inspire in my classroom, so I'd be happy to chat. And years teaching an AP course. This last column here is that it's my first year teaching an AP course. So it looks like not only are we new to AP pre-calculus, but a lot of teachers are also new to a teaching AP. And years teaching pre-calc. This is like a really nice mix here, Greg. Okay. We have a lot of people in that early years and then several in the more than 10 years. Right. Okay, Always good great. to know your audience. Okay, great. So uh, are we ready to get on to doing some mathematics? I'm always ready to get on to doing some mathematics. Although I'm going to stop first for just one moment and share. Greg and I did decided we wanted to make sure you knew what some resources were before we jump into the math because that's what we're going to geek out on and so very quickly just showing you that we do have a lot of support through ap classroom if you are teaching this and you have an approved audit then you have ap classroom at your disposal this is from college board Another thing that I've been using a lot is um, the education.ti.com website. There's activities already made for pre-calculus. This, um, this particular website, the 84 Activity Central, that one has a lot of activities for the TI-84. And then I'm a, a TI Inspire user, so I go to TI Math Inspired, and I pull website or several activities from this website too. The nice thing I think about this is the handouts are done as Word documents, so I can um, adjust them and revise them for my own students' needs. And so that's something I really like as a teacher, being able to differentiate. So Greg, when we were talking about this over the past month, what I think we realized is that there's kind of a philosophy for teaching AP pre-calculus. And um, I'm gonna hand it over to you to go over this, but these were, were some of the things we noticed together. Okay. The slides are still advancing uh, slowly for me. So why don't you uh, read those for, uh, oh, here we go, it just advanced. So philosophy for teaching AP pre-calculus. Um, as, as was mentioned, as one of the practices, one of the three practices is multiple representations. And closely connected with this is the power of visualization. Rate of change, change in tandem, uh, graphical transformation, some of these overarching uh, threads that go throughout the course that we've already talked about briefly. Well, gosh, it would be hard before calculus to make sense of these increasing, decreasing, concavity without visual representations. So the graphical representation is especially important, but it shouldn't be done in isolation. So again, not doing things in silos. So in the multiple representations, it's not just, okay, today we're gonna to do graphical, tomorrow we're gonna to do um, algebraic, it's that you link those. How is the graph related to the equation? How is the graph related to the table of values? How is the graph related to the verbal description? How are the different representations related to each other? And then the language and communication is obviously essential to be able to make those connections. 
to use the visual and link that to other things and to keep this from being a siloed course. And then um, it's our philosophy that we should celebrate and elevate the mathematical practices, which are fluency, procedural fluency uh, with algebraic procedures and with uh, graphing calculator procedures, technology procedures. Your students should be comfortable being given a, a, a table of values and creating a scatter plot or given an equation, creating the associated graph. Um, and then uh, being able to uh, link those representations, which is the second practice, and then to be able to communicate and reason about those and reasoning and communication are linked. So the, the communication in a math class or on the AP exam when you write out your solution to a, a free response item has to be reason-based communication. What's the evidence? What's the reason for drawing the conclusion that you've drawn? And then uh, when we talk about fluency, I've already said this a couple of times, that fluency isn't just algebraic fluency, although that is essential. You want students to be able to do the algebra on paper and pencil. You also want them to have facility with uh, using the technology. So there's two kinds of fluency instead of just one. Okay. And so now I think we'll showcase this. We'll showcase how all of these things are incorporated together. The, the next slide, the, the one that I'm putting up right now is an exam question, a, a, um, an example of an exam question. They have not released any um, field tested questions yet, but this is found in the CED that is currently on College Board's website for AP Precalculus. And it's a free response question where a graphing calculator is allowed and encouraged it says required, I like encouraged because I like to encourage my kids. Um, but I love this example because it really focuses on all those things that Greg was just saying about multiple representations. We have a table, we have a function, we have composition. And so Greg and I just wanna take a little time to go through this. Once again, because most of you are using the TI-84, we're gonna go ahead and showcase it with that technology today. Okay. So, Greg, when I showed you this the other day, what were your first thoughts as you um, as you looked over this? Well, some of you may not see it yet, but the the uh, I wanted to say a couple things. CED stands for the Course and Exam Description. So, if you Google AP Precalculus Course and Exam Description, you can get the full. Uh, two, 300 page book that explains um, the topics and uh, gives sample questions in detail. This sample question is very interesting because it presents one function, it pre presents F verbally and tabularly. It says that F is a function that is strictly increasing for from x uh, from zero to positive infinity. So it's a function that's defined for positive real numbers and defined for zero. So we would say it's defined for non-negative real numbers. And it's increasing over that interval of non-negative real numbers, x greater than or equal to zero. And moreover, it passes through a set of five given points. So they give a table of values let me tell you, okay, imagine a function that passes through these points and is strictly increasing for, uh, for non-negative real numbers. Um, now it says questions. Thank you for coming on my screen. Greg, it's okay. I think we've got it all working. Okay. We, we've got that Ohio lag going on today. I'm not sure what's happening. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so most people can see this. And then the other, the G is given in symbolic form. G is given as a, a, a quotient of a um, cubic polynomial over a linear polynomial. And so students who are taking the exam 
throughout the year, you want to try to get them to look before they leap. So they should take a deep breath, look at the problem, following polia, they should try to make sense of the problem and understand it. So a natural thing to do would be to plot that set of ordered pairs. And it was easy to see that, oh, it looks like there, there could be an increasing function that goes through those ordered pairs. And to, to plot the, the cubic function. And then, um, then to look at the questions and think about what is the best approach to solving each of these sub-questions. Do I use a graphical approach? Do I use a numerical approach? Do I use a verbal approach? Do I, you know, uh, uh, do I use an algebraic approach? What's the, the, the best way to, to deal with this? So what's the first question there, Rachel? I don't, don't have it in front of me, but go ahead and voice it anyway for everyone, please. So we're given a table with X and F of X where the X values are one, two, three, four, five. The F of X values are negative 10, negative 5, 4, 17, and 34. And before I go on to the question, I'm seeing a lot in the chat. People are asking for the number of the page in the CED. And this is from page 166 in the CED. And so if anybody wants to pull that up, I'm not sure why there's quite a lag. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to hear, Elena. So hopefully it's working for everyone. I appreciate the feedback. So um, what the first question is saying is let f be an increasing function defined for values of x greater than or equal to zero. The table gives values of f of x at selected values of x. And the function g is given by the function g of x equals, and it's a rational function. So the numerator of that function is x cubed minus 14x minus 27, and the denominator is x plus 2. Then, Greg, they start to ask about composition of functions. Yeah, and I now inverse. see it. It just came up. Perfect. Just in time. So, um, <laughs> so the first, the first question. So there's a lot of preamble, but, but the first question is the function H is defined uh, by a composition G following F of X or G of F of X. Find the value of uh, H of five as a decimal approximation and indicate that it is not uh, or indicate that it is not defined. So some students would be uh, flummoxed by this because it's like, we don't have a formula for F, we only have a formula for G. So how can I possibly do this? But this is the, where the multiple representations come in because we can find F of five because the table tells us that when X is five, F of X is 34. But then if you're gonna put 34 as an input into G, you probably want to have G stored as, I would store it as Y2. I tend to put F as Y1, G is Y2, um, or F1 and F2 if you're using an Inspire. And so if G is Y2, then on the home screen, you could just calculate what is Y2 of uh, 34. So you have to realize that, okay, step one, I plug five into F, that gives me an answer of 34 based on the table. And then I take that 34 as my input in the next step, substitute that into G. And then uh, it, because we're dividing, we may not get a whole number. And so when asked for a decimal approximation, uh, we want to do three paces, three places for an AP. Uh, uh, question that they want you to round to three decimal places. So, so that's Greg, something. I actually, I'm sorry for interrupting. I actually typed this into my calculator. So folks, if there's a lag, I'm going to go ahead and put the calculator up now. So hopefully we'll be able to see that. Mm -hmm. So 
once we plug everything in, and I have my students actually plug it in as a fraction, I want them to feel just as good about fractions as they do about decimals. So I plugged it in to the fraction template by hitting alpha y equals, and then once I put that output of f of x into the input, um, we were able to, I know, me too, Karen. Um, so we were able to go ahead and put that in and see it both as a fraction and as a decimal approximation. Oh. And like you were saying, Greg, three decimal places. Right, and, and this one is gonna be tricky for some students. So it's 1,077 and 806 thousands. So 1,077.806. So if they do 805, they might lose a point on the uh, on this question uh, just for uh, rounding. Now, may I see your Y equals menu? Uh, Absolutely. Do you perchance have this function stored as Y2? So I have the rational function stored as Y1. That's cool. So go back to the home screen. Greg, we do have a quick question. They were, um, Juan was asking about the, the concept of this. Is it a strictly monotonic function the way it's being defined? And I'm assuming, Juan, that you're talking about the function F. And should students know that vocabulary? When I was answering that question, Greg, of, about a monotonic function, I don't remember seeing that vocabulary anywhere in the CED, but I just wanted to, to share that question with you because I know that both of us had read through it several times, but I wasn't sure yeah. if you had seen yeah, it. Yeah, I don't think um, they avoid being monotonous. They, they don't use the term monotone function or uh, the function is uh, a monotonous uh, but or monotone, but if you want to use that as an instructor, that's fine. They may encounter that when they go uh, to college or university. So it doesn't hurt anything. Now, uh, time is somewhat limited, but can you go down to Y2 just for fun? Always. I can always if, go down to Y2 for fun. If we wanted to move this function, we could say recall and recall a second function of answer or second function of store i'm sorry and store is uh in the uh near the bottom second to the bottom row first position so you can go down to y2 uh, on the y equals menu okay i think i have and well then, maybe then I have recall. okay and then recall let me just make second. sure because i don't want to type over this so we're going to double check our work there we go so second Store, which is our recall. And then then we can get Y1 from the um, from the VARS menu. So you can go to VARS and then this uh, then go to function variables. Y VARS. And uh, then under there would be Y1, I guess, that we want to recall and I'll pop into Y2. So. And I'm so glad that you've shown me that te technique because yeah, I am using the Inspire where I just copy and paste all over the place. And so. Th this is the TI-84 version of copy and paste. So recall something, you can recall a, an answer or a function or this or that. And, and so we can move that in case we want to put F uh, uh, later on, we're probably going to create a, something for F. Well, now let's go to the home screen. This function, this rational function that was given in the problem that's called G of X is now for us both Y1 and Y2. So if we say Y2 of 34, and the way we get Y2 is again to go to VARS and, and Y VARS and the first choice under Y VARS. And um, and then uh, watch and then use parentheses so it, this calculator understands function notation. So you say parentheses six, uh, thirty-four is the input. So 
So that's so cool. That is so cool. <laughs> then if you press enter, you should get an answer that looks somewhat like the previous answer. Um, oh, it matches exactly, doesn't it? Um, it does. So, so anyway, um, there's lots of different procedures that could be used uh, here. And the greater the fluency that the student has both in uh, the way Rachel approached this, she was substituting in numbers into the formula, so she understood, you know, how, how uh, substitution works. So she used some algebraic and numerical fluency, and the other one is to kind of use symbolic fluency uh, together with calculator fluency. Uh, so there's different approaches, but if if students are really good just at algebra. That's not enough. If they, they need to have this multiple representations approach. Okay, so All right, just two things real fast in the chat. Um, there was a lot of commotion over saying that truncated values don't work, and there was some clarification from Gail, Gail Burrell that in AP calculus you can either round or truncate to three decimal place accuracy. So um, either one will just count. Make sure. Either okay. one would count. And then Derek's getting a little bit excited about this F of X table that we've got here. So we kind of jumped over to G of X, played around with that a little bit. But Derek's like, I have all sorts of things I'm noticing about that table. So I think, um, do you want me to go ahead and pull up my list then? For yeah, let's look at what table. you have in your uh, lists. Thanks, Gail, for pointing out truncation's okay. I would still teach my students how to round properly. Um, but they do, won't be penalized on the exam. That's good to know for, for something as small as that. So there's our, our values. Uh, one of the th uh, things that uh, is talked about in this new uh, course description for, for AP is, is to look at differences in values. So what, how fast is it changing? So if we want to look at the changes from one Y value to the next, we can do that in one fell swoop. If we go up to L3, um, there's a list uh, operation called delta list. It looks at the changes from one uh, number in the list to the next. So, um, so I use the list command by hitting second stat. I'm going over to where it says ops and down to delta list, which is what Greg just mentioned. And so I'm gonna go ahead and do that while L3 is highlighted. And which um, which list do we wanna find the delta of folks? You can put it in the chat. I know Greg's gonna say it in a second, but we'll give you a second to add into the chat because we love audience participation. Okay. So you went to second stat to get list, then you went over to ops, and then is it choice number seven or something? It was. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, because for those of us who are slow, uh, you might not have seen that. It's just showed up now as Delta list on the screen for me. And they're saying in chat that it should be list number. Well, they haven't shared yet, or maybe go, I'm just lagging on the go, chat. Go ahead and share or go ahead. And I think you can probably type it in. So we're looking at, we want to look at the changes in Y. So where would the changes in Y be? So I put all my values into list one. Um, just to address Sharon's question, Sharon, the way that I put all these values in here is I press the stat button first. Um, so I'm gonna just close out of this for just a moment because the this version of AP Precalculus, I think really focuses on making sure students know regressions, residuals, these things that used to be in like Algebra 2 courses or they used to be in statistics courses are now being integrated into this building models concept in AP Precalculus. So knowing where to put list in, I think is really important. We do that by going to stat and that button right next to our, our arrow keys here, and we choose enter, which is edit, and that's where we're entering these lists. So I'm glad that you were, um, brought that up, Sharon, because there I think there's a lot of people who have that question. And it gives us a chance to go back and make sure that we remember what Greg said. So for Delta list, 
as long as L3 is highlighted, we can go back to that list function, which was second stat, over to ops. And then when we go down, oops, I hit the wrong button. I'm sorry, folks. There we go. When we go down, we can go down to number seven, which is delta list. Or you can and simply type the number seven either way. Or we can do seven. That's more, much more efficient. Okay, and by now everybody knows that we want to look at the changes in list number two. Uh, so we'll just type list two there um, down below where you have the delta list going. And then you can press enter. You can close the parentheses or not. It'll take it either way. Awesome. And so great. now what do we notice here? Uh, from negative 10 to negative 5, that's a change of 5. That seems correct. From negative 5 to 4, that's an increase of 9. From 4 to 17 is an increase of 13. From 17 to 34 is an increase of 17. Is there a pattern to these changes? Hmm. The uh, Some students would say that looks like an arithmetic progression. Uh, because it's going up by four each time. If they notice that, then they would say, well, then the differences are of a linear nature, so the original function values must be quadratic. A quadratic polynomial would fit perfectly through the five given points in the given table. We could do the delta list again uh, as an alternative to see that those differences are four. And, but this time we would be looking at the changes in our new list, list number three, instead of the original uh, list of Y values. So these are the changes in the changes. So these are the second order changes. And the second order changes are constant. The first order changes are linear. The original uh, Y values in the table, therefore, uh, are quadratic in the way they're changing. Notice, importantly, that list one is an arithmetic progression. List one, you're going up by one each time. If the question gave you uh, the Y values for one and two, and then maybe six and seven, then you would have to look at both the, uh, the changes in Y and the change in X. But if the X's are changing uniformly, if the, like, if the X values are an arithmetic progression, then you can look at just the Y uh, changes and then the changes in the changes or second order changes in Y. And you don't have, uh, you don't have to worry about um, uh, the fact that you, you have some, something crazy going on with X. But they, they made this nice for us, the X values change. So, um, there were people who were asking about this earlier, you were saying in chat, um, Rachel. Yeah, so Derek was pointing out that the, um, I wanna make sure I use his words. He was saying this table of F of X is clearly second degree because the second differences are the same. And so this way of using the calculator very efficiently to come up with this Delta list, um, I think is a great way to have students look for those patterns and it's still going to be really efficient. We can move them through to the conceptual understanding of it because the calculator is doing a lot of this procedural task can, for them. Can you go back to the um, sample test question itself? Absolutely. So uh, Derek is anticipating a question that comes later on. If you look at the very last question c part two i think it is or, or let's look at c1 first use the table of values of f of x to determine if x is best modeled by a linear quadratic exponential or logarithmic function so this is taking something from another part of the um, course uh, guide the idea of differences and second differences uh, that Derek picked up on. And so I think based on Derek's analysis, you say, oh, quadratic is going to be the best fit. And then 
the rationale is what's called for. And that's where the communication piece comes in. It says, give a reason for your answer based on the relationship between the change in the output values of F and the change in the input values of, uh, of, of F. The input values are uh, an arithmetic progression. So there's a constant rate of change. But if you look at the change in the output values, and you do not get a constant change in output values. You, the the uh, changes in outputs, what, what we saw in list number three, were an arithmetic progression. And so the second differences in, in the output values are constant. The first differences of the input values are constant. And that tells us that we have a quadratic relationship expressed within the table. But wait, wait, there's more. If we go back to the original problem state and it says, let f of f be an increasing function defined for x greater than or equal to zero. The table gives values of, uh, uh, of selected values of x. Would this quadratic that we would get from this quadratic fit be increasing for x greater than or equal to zero? We don't know yet. We would have to explore more. And this is not really asked in this question, but this is something that we discovered in analyzing this question. So giving something like this to your class to chew on and use as an exploration and say, is there anything else that you notice about this? Or you could create some additional questions besides the ones that are asked here. These are some really cool functions to look at. So we've got these data in L1 and L2. We know that the relationship between them um, uh, uh, could be polynomial, that a polynomial, a, a second degree polynomial or quadratic would fit through those. So let's go to the home screen and do a little bit of modeling, a little bit of curve fitting, a little bit of regression. And I think you'd go to stat, the stat button. And uh, then you have stat and do you have a regression or a calc or something that allows you to choose something? Let's choose the fifth choice. Five is quadratic regression. So you could choose five, then list one and list two, those look good. But let's store our answer in Y1. Remember, we have uh, G in Y2 and Y1, but I want to put F in Y1. Just, that just helps me keep them straight. F comes before G in the alphabet. Let's have Y1 come before Y2. So then uh, where it says there is no frequency list, so we would go to uh, next to store equation, you would go to vars, y vars, what uh, function vars, and choose the first function variable, which would be y1. And then once you paste that in um, to the home screen, then you calculate and it will um, you go down to calculate and press enter. And then you wait for it to calculate the equation. It, and it should give you the uh, a, b, and c coefficients. Sure enough, it does. 2, negative 1, and negative 11. And if we go to y1, it should be um, uh, have been pasted there, the, that resolving quadratic function. And sure enough, it's there. So why Greg, we... I want to point out real fast, sorry for interrupting, but I, um, um, I've seen so many teachers have their students like write down A and B and C and then go to the Y equals function and type this in. And since we're talking about efficiency so we can get to conceptual learning, that strategy that you just did there of storing the equation 
in the Y1 function. I think it's really important because it's driving home this idea that it's a function we're using and why is it a function? We can talk about that conceptually, but it's just saving all this time and potential mistake of typing in something incorrectly so that we can use our time wisely when we're with students and time is precious and we can get to the conceptual part. Right. So I just wanted to point that out as a teacher. Yeah, and the, the other side of the coin is when they take the exam, they don't have an infinite amount of time to write solutions to these questions. They, they are in a limited time frame. And if they can focus more of their time on thinking and less of their time on uh, manipulation, then then uh, they'll be better off uh, and less stressed during the exam. Okay, so let's go to Zoom. And uh, the Zoom menu, uh, we could go to the window and think about how to set the window, but I'm going to go to Zoom uh, first. And since we have these data, let's see, do we, I don't know whether we have the, the plot set up for for the data. So before we do the, the zooming, maybe we should go to a second function of Y1 and make sure we've got um, a, a uh, we're going to have a scatter plot of the data. And so the set, let's go to uh, the first plot set up there. And it says it's off. We better turn that bad boy on. And I always tell my students to double check those X and Y list. We play around with this a whole lot in my classes. And so make sure that you are graphing what you intend to graph. All right, so, so turn this on and then uh, the rest looks okay. It looks like we've chosen a type of plot as a scatter plot. List or X list is L1, Y list is L2. The mark is going to be a little square in blue. That's all cool. Now, it, press Y1 just for fun um, because uh, this will show us something too. If we go to Y1, now if you look at the top, it has plot one, plot two, plot three. Notice that plot one is highlighted. So instead of going to, to uh, the, the setup, we could have check to see whether the plot was turned on here, but it doesn't tell us the nature of the plot. So going into the um, uh, plot setup, you get a lot more details. Now let's go to Zoom. There's some data to be graphed. And if we go to Zoom, there's a Zoom stat. And the Zoom stat will allow you to capture the data in the scatter plot. Um, so again, this is just a, a calculator procedural kind of thing that uh, might help. You can also set it up, just set up the window. So have you pressed Zoom, uh, Rachel? I guess you did press Zoom and did some other stuff too, um, but I just couldn't see it. My, my computer's slow. But it does look like uh, the red curve, which if we trace, we can see which thing is which. So go to trace, if you would, please. Um, there are three things to be traced here. You can trace the plot, and the, the ordered pairs in the plot should be the ordered pairs that were in our table, and sure enough, they are. That's good. If you do use a down arrow, it'll take you to Y1. Y1 should be our quadratic. And it sure looks visually like the quadratic goes straight through these points. We could type a, a, a whole number like three uh, when we're tracing. If you say three enter, what happens, Rachel? When you're right to that point, then it says X equals three. And when you press return, it takes you to, to that. And you can see that the Y value of uh, for the y1 function, for the, the, our f of x function, is um, 4 when x is 3, which is the same as the data point. So we're not on the data graph because it's red. So we're on the red curve, but it matches the blue points. Um, okay. Uh, and then we also have this other curve showing in the window. And, of course, that's our um, rational function, which we haven't uh, looked at completely. Uh, let's go to window now. 
Okay. And why don't we um, make our X min zero? Um, it's not zero from the Zoom stats. So why don't we go from zero to 6.6? .6. And I'm picking so 6.6 6 because I think that's our decimal window number. So X min 0, X max 6.6. .6. And then regraph. Nice. I'm going to hit graph. And I got a question from Laura. It said, she says, do I have to hit something first before going to 3? And Laura, you shouldn't have to. So if you hit the trace button up at the top and then you hit 3, it should go ahead and do that. Now, I don't know if I said um, clearly that we were hitting trace. I think I was just doing right. that and I need to communicate yeah. better, right. but you make wanna, sure you hit trace first. You wanna press trace before you press three. Yeah. Awesome. And, and some classrooms you may wanna avoid using the, the verb hit. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's a fair point. <laughs> that, that, that sounds a little bit violent um, for, for some people. Anyway, um, but now if I look at this graph carefully, the red graph, the quadratic graph, I'm wondering whether that's strictly increasing here. So why don't we see if there's a minimum value for that function within this window? So can you go to second function of trace and you have some different kinds of calculus like capabilities at the pre calculus level, like finding the minimum of a function. Uh, so where does this minimum occur? Um, So Greg, I pressed second calc, we put in minimum, um, and I also am recognizing we only have about two or three more minutes because okay. Kevin needs to announce a winner, but um, it's asking for a left bound. And so- Let's use zero. Let's use zero as the left bound. If there's a minimum, it's probably gonna be between zero and one. So zero for the left bound and one for the right bound. And now while you're, Doing that, you can look at the, if you think of negative B over 2A, you might recognize that there should be a minimum at 1 fourth because negative B would be 1 and 2A would be 4. And then, get, so let's guess 1 fourth or, or guess 1 half. It doesn't matter. Some number in between our left and our right uh, bounds. And when we press enter, we do get... Uh, Okay, press enter and see what happens. And sure enough, there is a minimum. And so there's a little tricky thing here. This is actually decreasing from zero to one fourth and then increasing. So this is a good model, but it's not a correct model. It doesn't model all the characteristics of F. F is supposed to be increasing on zero to infinity. And this model does not increase for that first little bit from zero to one fourth. Let's turn it over to Kevin uh, to wrap things up. Okay. Wow. Thank you. I, I mean, boy, I, I sort of, I, I was head down. I'm glad I had my alarm on to, to note that it was five minutes because I started to lose track of time. I got sort of caught into what we were doing. So, Thank you so much for, for that. I kind of think there's, I'm probably not alone wishing we had a little bit more time, but we do have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, uh, we have to uh, let people be able to go to the next session as well. Um, so let me just uh, share quickly because we, yeah, we do get to announce this next part, which is always exciting. Um, but one of first off before I forget then to thank uh, Greg, thank Rachel for taking us through and, and being, allowing to be very interactive and allowing people to be able to uh, ask things, suggest things, and really work with the, uh, the various different questions that came through the chat. Um, thank you. There's an awful lot, uh, I think, for people to be able to explore and appreciate as well demonstrating this with the technology. Um, so a reminder, you're going to get the chance to the resources will be posted as well uh, with the, the PowerPoints. So you can follow up as well as the recording. 
And as we note for each of the sessions amongst our live attendees, one of the uh, benefits of being here live is we uh, randomly select someone. And I did that and the winner of a graphing calculator, and we'll follow up uh, with you, uh, I think early next week, I believe, to determine which calculator you would like. Um, but that winner is uh, Lori McDonald. Yay. So uh, Lori will be in, in touch uh, with you uh, and uh, follow up. But thank you everyone for joining us. I really appreciate your uh, time with us and uh, hope you enjoy. There's still a couple more breakout sessions to go for today. Um, so thank you again and to Rachel and to Greg and to everyone for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Oh, I gotta remember to stop the recording. <laughs>